um, I pre I preached a sermon on Sunday called the boss on the cross. No, I no. Let me start again. I preached a sermon. Not I told a story on Sunday in place of a sermon. Uh, called the boss, called um the the up on the shelf versus the boss on the cross. And in that story, I made reference to a sermon that this that the the demon elf <laughs> um I heard after terrorizing the neighborhood. And the Lord said, I want you to preach what the elf heard. So this uh, surprise sermon on a Tuesday came from um, that story. So this is essentially what the elf heard uh, to change his life and to stop him terrorizing the neighborhood. If you want to hear that story and hear the genesis of, of that story, uh, go back a few videos and you'll see it. Um, I didn't put a title on the actual video because at the time I didn't know what it was called. Um, but if you go back to videos, you'll see it. Um, I talk about the genesis of the story and I tell the story. Um, and here is the sermon that the elf heard. So let us pray. Father, I praise you and I worship you. And thank you, Lord, for being with us um, for this surprise sermon on a Tuesday afternoon. We know that you're not the God of Sunday, but you're the God of every day. And every day you can choose to speak your word to your people. Sunday is actually the day that we chose um, to gather together, but that doesn't mean you only speak on Sunday. You, you speak every day, and I just pray that this word um, speaks so mightily to people that it goes beyond a story and that and that it can be the catalyst to change somebody's life today. Speak to me, speak through me, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, so guys, um, I have never been one for gangster movies and all those blood and gore movies. I'm more, uh the romance movie, sometimes an adventure movie or something, but um, The Godfather is one of the biggest selling movie franchises of all time. And that whole um, mob boss thing and the whole thing with violence and the mob and um, uh, people being terrorized by the mob, the mob um, having to be stopped by the police, and there's this whole obsession with it. And I think the obsession is, number one, because of the power that these people seem to have, and number two, because of the uh, unknown, we, we just are fascinated by underground goings on and like um, having all this stuff that we don't know about the secrecy of these societies and what's going on. And um, I think. And some of these mobster movies are quite funny. Some of them are quite serious, but I've seen a couple of uh, funny monster movies. Uh, one, uh, not monster, mobster movies. One with Hugh Grant, 
I forget the name of it. That was a mobster movie, but it's funny. It was, uh, I believe Hugh Grant had a girlfriend, and her family was part of the mob. So it's been a part of our culture long since The Godfather. And when I think of, uh, when I go back to the uh, Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John, uh, the, the Synoptic gospel, go, Gospels being Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, which are, which are, which is essent essentially the same story, but told from, from three different perspectives. Um, um, when we look at the syn synoptic gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew was concerned with, uh, predominantly, you'll hear a lot in Matthew, about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. He'll say it over again. And Matthew is where you get the, the sermon, where you get uh, the Sermon on the Mount, where you get, which includes the Beatitudes, which are blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed are this and blessed are that. That comes in Matthew. And you'll hear Jesus in Matthew talk about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. He'll say it over and over again in Matthew. And Matthew, if I'm not mistaken, is the longest gospel. Um, with, I think, 31 chapters, if I've got it wrong. If I've got it right, um, so it has a lot in it, and it talks a lot about the kingdom that is at hand, the kingdom, the kingdom, it, it, it never stops talking about the kingdom. Uh, the Gospel of Luke, since Luke was a doctor, he gives all kinds of um, different details from a different perspective than the Gospel of Matthew does. Um, he, he really, it's just, it, it seems, a couple of the stories are the same as in Matthew and the other Gospels, but he gives a very different perspective um, and Luke, actually, most people take the Christmas story this time of year from Matthew, from Matthew, but I like the Christmas story in Luke. Luke 2 is the, bo the boss when it comes to the Christmas story because it tells you, um, the story of Mary and who she was as a person. So it seems that Luke is very concerned about humanity, the humanity of the the person, because you, you can read Luke 2, the story of uh, Mary and what... Um, the story of that, what happened in Luke, and Luke is very concerned, not so much with genealogy, but more with, I think, humanity. From Luke, you hear the story of, of Mary, all of, and you hear, you hear, hear about it from, uh, a very human perspective, and it is in Luke where you hear about Jesus um, being 12 years old in the temple, so I think Luke is focused on humanity. You, you do get the miracle stories in Luke, but 
but you get it from a humanitarian perspective, I think. And Mark, things, ha Luke, I think, has, um, tw 24 chapters. No, Matthew has 21 chapters. I said 31, but I think it's 21. And Luke has 24 chapters. And Mark, Mark goes quick. Mark is focused on, Jesus is always moving in Mark. Oh my gosh, he just never stops. It's like immediately, 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 he does a miracle, boom, something else happens. He does another miracle, boom, something else happens. So it seems like to suggest that Jesus is always moving, always progressing, always on the go. So when I when I look at the three synoptic gospels, I see a, a different perspective of Jesus in Matthew, in Luke, and in Mark. Now John is a totally different ballgame. In most circles, it's included in the synoptic gospels, but it's written differently. It seems um, to be like a whole different universe. Like, like remember how I said in Luke, from my opinion, it speaks about the humanity of people? Well, in John, um, it speaks about more about the humanity of Jesus for me, and it's written differently. It doesn't. It doesn't have the same cadence. The first three gospels um, are different aspects or different perspectives on the miracles of Jesus. John takes it you through the miracles of Jesus, but it's more focused on the humanity of Jesus. It's more focused on um, uh, who Jesus was as a person. It's in John where he says, where he gives the seven I am's. I am the door. I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. And it goes on and on and on. It's more about Jesus uh, stating who he is in John um, than it is anything else. And you see, and you see, and you see uh, um, the scripture where it says, I've called you disciples. But now I call you friends. So that's where Israel Holton gets uh, the term friend of God because he calls us friends. And that whole thing is in John. And that's why I believe most people say when people are starting to read the Bible, tell them to read John because you get the real humanity of Jesus. Not that you don't get a few vehicles of Jesus, but it's put together in a more human way to, to describe Jesus as a person. And not so much focus on what he did and how he did it, but more him as a person. That's my perspective. And when I look at the... Mo the the whole mob thing when it comes to um, Jesus being kind of uh, a mob boss, not in a bad way, but in a very good way, and how he um, how he um, found his disciples, he took fishermen, which was like one of the most 
lowly careers of the day, these people would would fish um, uh, for hours, and they would they would catch fish to sell or to perhaps eat themselves, but mostly to sell. This is what they did as a job, these, these guys, these fishermen. And tax collectors um, were the most hated people of the day because they would take money from people and tax them and, and do awful things if they couldn't pay. So the fact that Jesus took these fishermen and a few tax collectors and, and made them his disciples, he knew the kind of people he wanted in his, in his mob in the, in his, to teach and to instruct and to, um, and to learn from him. He knew that he didn't want uh, religious people because he wanted people that were eager to learn. He wanted people that didn't, didn't do anything before, um, didn't do anything like this before because people with experience fight against you, but people with inexperience learn from you. And he wanted people uh, who could learn from him. So he took these 12 um, guys. Some of them were families, some of them were not. And just took them under his wing and, and trained them. And then they were just fishing, minding their own business, a few of them. And he said, come on, let me just take you under my wing and just train you. So, um, and then he started for three years training them. And then as he trained them, he began to um, give them uh, his, how to... Um, how to talk to people, how to, how to communicate with people. He began to give them tools and, and tips and tricks about how to uh, bring people into the kingdom. And Jesus did what um, every good writing teacher tells you to do. Jesus showed them. Um, most of the time. Um, and he didn't tell them. Jesus, uh, aside from the Sermon on the Mount and a few other times, Jesus uh, preached, but he talked uh, very rarely. He preached, but when it came to the people he was training, he didn't talk quite often. The people he was training, when he, when they would ask him a question, he would just give a strange answer, like, um, or tell them a, a story, and they would be like, what did he say? Um, he, um, he, he taught by doing. And um, that's why they say actions speak louder than words, because G Jesus did that. And he was the king of um, the rhetorical question. He would just, he would just, they would ask him questions and he would just not answer or he would say questions that were not to be answered. It was really interesting. And that's how he gathered uh, his clout 
and that's how he he conducted his ministry. He did he did not ever once give out a tract. He did not ever once uh, preach in the synagogue. He did not ever once do any of that because he wanted his actions to speak for him. So that's how he he became the boss, not because of what he did, not because of lording his his kingdom over people, but he became the boss through his humility. He humbled himself. He made himself of no reputation so he could free people. And I think we've got it backwards. We we think we have to work and work and work and work to get people to see us. But when we just have to have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, and instead of using guns and force like real gangs, um, like most gangs use, like most mobs use, he used his words. And not only his words, but then he uses the word as a weapon. That's why it's so important to first know the scriptures and know um, know what he's second to know how he speaks to you, to know how the uh, how, um, uh, how he um, what your rhythm of God with God is, how he speaks to you, how he communicates with you, because that's how you'll develop a close relationship with him through communication. And he communicates in different ways. But the base of his communication is his word. So that's why it's important to use his word. And unlike most mob bosses, he doesn't he doesn't bring death. He brings life. And instead of using a gun, like most mob bosses do, he uses the sword of the spirit. He, he uses the sword of the spirit, which is his word. His word is a weapon. And so, if you're going through any issue, his there is a scripture for every circumstance. There is a scripture to speak to every circumstance. And some, sometimes people follow Bible reading plans and, and do stuff like that. And those are good. But all I would say is start reading. If you're not sure what to read, just start anywhere. And develop a rhythm with God where um, where it fits your lifestyle and what you can do. Don't try and do more than you can do, and, but push yourself at the same time to do something. Even if it's just to, to talk to him about what's really going on in your heart and to uh, meditate on whatever scripture hits your heart. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with Bible re reading plans. They can be really helpful, and there are a lot of um, good ones out there. But I'm saying um, get into a relationship where you know that God is speaking for you to to you about what to do in your life and everybody's road is different but you haven't gone so far to be to be used by God and he's just waiting for you to 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 say that you need him um the thing with society is that 
we strive and we strive for success. We strive and we strive for big, bigger cars. We strive and we strive for for all of this. But in the end, it gains us nothing. We lose our souls. So you have so many people right now who are in the midst of gaining, 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 and they're losing their souls. They're losing themselves because they don't know who they are because they don't know who created them. The best way to figure out who you are is to go back to your creator. And I'm here to tell you today, your creator loves you. Your not just loves you, but your creator likes you. Your creator thinks you're a wonderful person. And he's waiting to use your gifts and your talents. But more than using anything, using, uh, using your gifts or your talents is a byproduct of getting you. But more than that, he just wants you. He just wants you. He doesn't, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't first want what you do and what you have and what you could give him. He just wants your life, your heart, your space, yourself. He wants you and he wants to just get to know you and he wants you to to understand that you don't know you um so and he wants you to get to know you and he wants to reveal you to you and he also wants you guys to get to know um he also wants you to get to know yourself i misspoke the other day, um just now when I said he wants to get to know you. He already knows you. There's nothing he doesn't know about you. But he wants you to get to know you. He desperately wants you to know you. That's what's wrong with the world. We keep searching for validation. We keep searching for this. We, we keep searching for... Uh, to be seen, to be heard, to be validated, and to be accepted, and to be loved by people. But people didn't make you. People didn't make you. Stop giving people the power to de define who you are. Stop giving society the power to define who you are. Let Jesus, let God, the one who designed you, who knows your end from your beginning, who knows your weakness and strengths and loves you anyway. He doesn't just love you. He doesn't just want to want to use you like something you want to use and throw away. He likes you. He likes hanging out with you. He likes seeing you smile. He likes he likes your sense of humor. He likes everything. He likes everything about you. And yes, there are things in you that need to be worked on. But there are things in us all that need to be work on, worked on. We all are sinners. We've all fallen short in some way. We all sin every day. But he still has the grace to forgive us. And he still likes us and loves us and thinks we're the most beautiful, wonderful people ever. And his blood is there to just restore, cover and restore your sins. And he's just waiting for you today to stop going after success and to stop wanting to be the boss in your own life and to stop um, terrorizing people with bad attitudes and just with your with, 
in your house with your children. He just wants you to stop all that and realize that you're not the boss, that he is the boss. If any, if these two years have taught us anything, it's taught us that there is a bigger boss. There is a boss who died on the cross for you and for me. He came down when he didn't have to because of his love and his grace for us. He came down to a world that desperately needed him, to a world that that was surrounded by rules and laws and where people were struggling, suffering for for food and with medical things and with everything. They were really struggling, so he came down to show them the way. He came down to show them love. He came down to restore. And that same power that the boss on the cross had on that day, he died with that power to give them new life and us new life. When he died on the cross, he died for everything we will ever do wrong, for everything we did ever do wrong, for everything we are doing wrong right now. He died for all of it. He shed his blood, part of his life, um, on the cross for us. Because when you're losing blood, when somebody's losing blood, they're losing life. So when we say he shed his blood, we said, we are saying as Christians, he gave his life. He didn't only give his life by dying, which eventually did happen, but he gave his life by shedding by being cut and bruised and broken and releasing his blood for hours because when Eve sinned we were doomed to hell and it's because of his blood his shed grace that blood that he shed on the cross that was supposed to be our blood that was not supposed to be his blood. He did it because of his tremendous love for us. His amazing grace for us. He did it because of that. And that is the real boss. He, a, like a real boss of a business or any corporation, a real boss is someone who puts his life uh, for the company or those he's leading. Or a real boss is someone who who, who gives himself uh, for those he's leading. If you're a, a, um, a man with a family, listen to me right now. If you think being a boss or head of your home is lording over your wife and your children or scaring them or saying, I'm the man of the house, you need to listen to me, that's not a real boss. A boss takes on the weight on his shoulders so his wife and children don't have to take take it. Bosses don't sit around and just um, say, I'm the boss. I'm the man in the house. You need to listen to me. That's not a boss. A boss leads with humility and with love. Whether you're a boss of a business, whether you're a boss of a family, whether you're a boss as a single mom, whether you're a boss of a whatever, whether you're the boss of yourself, you have to lead with love and humility, not terror 
and everyone's afraid of you, so they listen to you because they're afraid of you. They're not listening to you. When you're a tyrant of a boss, of a company, or a family, they're not listening to you because they respect you or you inspire them. They're listening to you because you're afraid. They're afraid of you, and when you're go, and when they're, and when you're gone, they're n not being taught anything. If you lead with humility and love, and um, what I call great leadership, they're inspired by you and they want to work for you. So instead of being a tyrant and being, being hard to get along with, try and lead with love and humility and understanding. It's, it's really great when um, I watch Undercover Boss. Undercover Boss is a show, um, I don't know if it's still on now, where these people... Um, these bosses of these big companies go undercover to see what the real work uh, front line in their company is. And they always come out changed because, changed, because it is not until you walk in a person's shoes, feel what they feel and, and, um, live how they live, that you get to understand who they are. And when you understand who they are, you can lead them better. So you're wondering how you can lead better? Go and walk in the person's shoes that you're leading. And don't walk in the person's shoes that are uh, next to you or whatever. Go to the person in your company, in your church, that everybody ignores or doesn't pay attention to. Um, if you're a pastor and you have a person uh, with a disability in your congregation or a few people with disabilities in your congregation, go sit down with them. Go what the Bible says, sup with them. Get to know them. Get to know their needs. Get to know what they like. Get to know who they are. If you're... And also the custodians. Like, go to people in your leadership circle who can't give you anything. Don't ask the people that you pay to tell you uh, what, how the church is going. If you want to know how the church is really going, go to the people. Don't ask your executive team how the church is going. Don't look at YouTube numbers to see how your sermon is affecting people. Don't look at any of that because all that is just numbers and butts in, in the seats. But, and people who want to impress you and will tell you things because you're the boss. Go to the people that people ignore. Watch the look in people's eyes with, when that person with the disability is sitting in the corner and everybody's walking by them. That's the person who will tell you how your ministry is doing, how your company is doing, how everything is going. Because that's the the only way you'll know, you won't know by asking the executive team. You'll know by asking the custodian. You'll know by asking the pe person with a disability. You'll know by asking the senior who has to take the bus in the cold because no one is there to drive them to church or to work or they can't get transportation to get there so they're always late. That's what a real boss does. First of all, you lead uh, with humility and with love. 
and then you look for the person who everybody passes by and then you ask them how the company is doing. Don't look for answers from your executive team. Look for answers from the people that everybody passes by on their way to lunch. I'll see you. I'll see you later, guys. Bye. Thank you, God. I hope this sermon has affected every, everyone to, to know that you are the real boss, but you're no longer on the cross. You've, you've risen to give us new life, and we accept that new life today. In the name of Jesus, Amen. Merry Christmas, guys. I won't be on. I won't be on until the end of Jan. The no, not the end of January. The beginning of January. Um, the week after the New Year, second week of January, I'll be coming back with the Sunday sermons. Have a happy holiday. Merry Christmas to you and your family. And and be safe and stay healthy. Bye.